Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear sisters, it is uh, a joy for me to be present here among so many distinguished women and men from all over the world who are here to not only talk about representation of women in politics and in decision making, but also to bravely take on some of the most challenging and pressing issues of the day, whether it is war and security, propaganda and disinformation, violence and oppression, and even the rules that should govern our world order. Let me start by remembering the 24th of February, 2022. Like many people around the world, we could not believe that Russia invaded Ukraine. We, of course, knew about all the intelligence. We watched the developments. We worked on contingency plans, but thought that such a brutal, unjust, full-fledged war, such a blatant violation of international law, could just not happen. It could not happen in our neighborhood. We watched with trepidation the brave resilience of the Ukrainian fighters and the movement of the front line in Ukraine. The images from my visits to the border crossings with Ukraine will stay with me forever. The sorrow in the eyes of women and children who were fleeing the bombings and the shellings, who had to gather their belongings in just a few hours and leave their homes, the anxiety and worry that they had for their husbands and fathers who had to stay behind, the uncertainty they felt about their condition and the future of their country. But I will also remember the extraordinary mobilization and solidarity demonstrated by the Moldovan people, showing that Moldova is indeed a small country with a big heart. Volunteers, private sector organizations, non-governmental organizations, public servants on the local and on the national level all poured their energy into helping Ukraine and mitigating the effects of the war on our citizens. Just take a minute and think about these numbers. Since February 2022, over 780,000 Ukrainians crossed the border into Moldova, which is a country of just 2.6 million people. Some 100,000 refugees remain in Moldova, which serves both as a transit and destination country. At the highest point, we received five times more than our total capacity as estimated by the UNHCR. We also provided humanitarian support to the people of Ukraine, solidarity lanes for Ukrainian goods, and cooperation in a broad range of areas. But we did not only that. We managed the multiple consequences of the war in Ukraine and the growing hybrid war that Russia waged on us. We needed to ensure the well-being of our own people and our country's strategic interest. In just one year, we diversified our 100% dependency on Russian gas and provided our people with heating and light from alternative sources of energy. We increased pensions, wages, and provided a targeted energy vulnerability program to help people deal with increased prices. We stayed true to our promises and implemented structural reforms, which make Moldova ever more resilient, advancing on a number of international rankings on democracy, press freedom, combating corruption, and the rule of law. And perhaps most importantly, we obtained for our country the candidate country status to the EU as the only way and the only path to firmly anchor the future of our country in the free world. Now, 
I will let you judge. Is it a coincidence that all of these achievements happened when Moldova was one of the few countries and for a period the only country where both the president and the prime minister were women? where the Minister of Internal Affairs and the anti-corruption prosecutor are women, where 40% of our parliament, of our members of parliament, are women, we have a truly inspirational leader in our president, Maya Sandu. We also have many other women who are working tirelessly to ensure representation of women in decision making. And I salute here the head of our Parliamentary Foreign Affairs Committee, Doina German, and also my colleagues, our colleagues back home, who have been at the forefront of the fight for gender equality, who implemented first in the party and then in Parliament a double quota for women's representation in Parliament, and who are working despite all the overlapping crises to ensure that we uh, have a, a feminist and, uh, policy and, and gender equality. We did not choose the context to serve in, but we, have rose, to, we rose to the occasion and demonstrated that women can govern successfully in the most difficult of circumstances. So you make the judgment. I will not say that we had achievements because there were so many women, but at the very least, we demonstrated that governing is for women not just in social policy, in energy policy, in security policy, in uh, economic policy. Governing the country is a woman's job. <laughs> Unfortunately, as we speak, the freedom, security, and prosperity of the people of Ukraine are being threatened by the unjust war of aggression. Every day since February, innocent women and children, the young and the elderly, as well as the Ukrainian soldiers on the front lines of the war, are paying the ultimate price for defending us all and our European way of life. We are in the European Parliament, and I am addressing, first and foremost, the Europeans whose values are defended by the brave Ukrainians. They are paying this ultimate price through lives lost, the wounds suffered, and the destruction endured. And what saddens me today is that somehow we are starting to get used to living in the neighborhood of this conflict as we have gotten used to uh, wars and conflicts and waves of refugees in other parts of the world, and this is now, you know, starting to become not breaking news, but regular uh, news, newscasts, and it is becoming a new normal. We knew even before this war, and we all know here, that a war should never become a new normal. So, despite everything that we are facing in our countries, we should come together in fora like this and discuss how do we see the functioning of our societies? What legacy will we leave to our children? We should find solutions to uphold the international rules-based order, to sanction violations and hold those responsible accountable to ensure that the international community responds to crises like that, to wars in particular, in a consistent manner. I salute 
every one of you here and let us bravely discuss, decide, and govern. Thank you.